Hi friends, my name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals from Vegas. So there's a couple of things I wanted to show you today. Um, one is uh, a, a recent short speech. It's only a few minutes from Greta Thunberg. And by the way, uh, when I did a video about Greta Thunberg recently, uh, talking about the attempts by the capitalist class to uh, co-opt her, I wasn't saying that she has been co-opted, but I'm saying that they definitely are trying to co-opt her as they do with so many other uh, people who might be in, going to infringe somehow on capitalists and on profits, basically, of businesses and corporations. You know, and, and I referred to the image of Obama and uh, Greta Thunberg and talked about that. So today, though, I was wanting to show this little speech by Greta Thunberg because it's rather well put together by a 16-year-old. Um, uh, she might have a little bit of help, who knows, but... Uh, it basically is talking about how you and I, we are responsible in many ways for a lot of what is happening on, uh, happening, uh, in the world today. And that, uh, and that includes, you know, um, rich celebrities and all of that. We're all contributing to the climate emergency. Of course, there are a hundred companies that are causing a huge amount of, uh, greenhouse gases in the world. Uh, most of the West is causing most of the devastation. Um, animal agriculture, I speak about that often, and I'll show you those two memes. That's causing tremendous devastation, a major thing that we can all address by going vegan. Uh, but this is a, and in, in this speech by Greta Thunberg, which I think is a, a good one, she uh, mentions how, uh, you know, meat and dairy in particular are a real problem for, uh, you know, the consumption of meat and dairy, which I think I'm, I'm very happy that she's mentioned that. I know that She's vegan herself, self, and she says that she's vegan for ethical reasons and for, and in relation, and for the climate. Um, being vegan can make a tremendous, uh, impact on, uh, addressing our, um, you know, our, our input, our, uh, the devastation of climate, of the climate crisis. It can really make a, a huge, um, impact. So, uh, she's, but, you know, so she's vegan for, uh, because she doesn't want to use animals. This is what I understand from an interview she did with Democracy Now! Uh, a few months ago. But, um, so, so that's, that's, I prefer that. I prefer people become vegan for ethical reasons, which is what veganism is, for reasons that are, um, in relation to not wanting to continue on this terrible carnage, the torture and killing of one trillion plus land and aquatic animals every year for trivial reasons. We don't need to do that. We don't need animal products at all to survive, and we can easily meet all our nutrition requirements from plants and other non-animal sources. So um, I prefer that, you know, we go vegan for those reasons, for the reasons that we don't need, we should not, and we don't have the right to use non-human animals as things, as property, um, that because they're sentient. So it seems like Greta Thunberg is vegan for those reasons and also for the climate. And I see, although it's an ethical thing not to... Uh, be participating in the destruction of other animals' home, which is this earth, and also the climate refugees and all of that. It's an ethical position to not do that, um, to not participate in that by being vegan. Um, but it's also, you know, the most important reason is, is non-human animals. So, uh, you know, that was great that she mentioned that because, as I've said before, um, and I know that some people argue with me about this, but um, green groups... Um, if you watch Cowspiracy, you'll understand why a lot of green groups do not mention veganism, but also the big dollar is why um, green groups do not mention veganism, and I include Extinction Rebellion and the Sunrise Movement in that. They have a big donate button on the top of their website, and they don't want to challenge the public um, because that would mean they might impact their donations. So that's I see is probably just like any animal group, that is, uh, has a big donate button at the top of their site and doesn't want to challenge people to go vegan because they want donations and they don't care if you're not vegan or you're vegan. They don't care. They just want donations. So, um, you know, this, the same goes sadly with, uh, you know, if you watch Cowspiracy, you can see how animal industry has been donating to green groups and different, uh, large corporations have been donating to green groups. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, um, I've mentioned before, and I've done a couple of videos about Extinction Rebellion and the problems with the ignoring the elephant in the room, veganism. So you can check them out. I'm not going to go into that again. Uh, so, so anyway, it's good that Greta Green, uh, Greta Thunberg has uh, mentioned that because, uh, because nobody else really does. It's sad that a 16 year old, uh, young woman from Sweden 
has to be going around saying uh, the un the inconvenient truth that we need to go vegan. Um, you know, it's sad that a 16 year old is left with that task um, because all the adults in the room don't seem to want to address just something that is really simple that we can all do. I find that truly astounding. It's like a it's like out of a, some strange movie to see a 16 year old having to go around and say these un comfortable truths to people that we all need to go vegan or that we need to uh, all individually address instead of pointing the finger at all these corporations who are not going to do anything including governments they're not they're going to trim around the edges and they're going to just keep on with this eco side so it's really up to us with either she's not saying this but it's oh she's saying it's up to us individually um but and I'm saying also that it's um as you know as Chris Hedges the Pulitzer Prize recipient said it's really nonviolent civil disobedience is where it's at now. Because, you know, the days of appealing to people's ethics and government and appealing to, they know what they're, they're not, they know what they're not doing. Uh, they don't need a 16 year old to tell them, like Obama doesn't need a 16 year old to tell him what we're not doing and what we need to do. A 16 year old doesn't need to tell the UK parliament when she went to speak to them what we're not doing and what we need to do. They don't need to be told that at all. It's ridiculous, but it's, it's, it's good. It's good that somebody is, is telling people that they need to stop consuming meat and dairy. I prefer them stop consuming all animal products because they're all disastrous. Um, so, uh, you know, and they're, they're all products of tremendous violence and we don't need to use them. They're killing us. You know, the most uh, 100, 800,000 deaths in the United States or plus are caused by, uh, you know, directly caused by the consumption of animal products in the amounts that we eat them. Um, and then there's all the climate catastrophe that is occurring because of animal agriculture. If you check out that most recent study, 119 uh, countries, 40,000 farms from farm to fork, 90% of all the foods that we eat. The conclusion from that study, the largest study to date, is that we uh, that becoming vegan is the single most important thing we can do to address the climate crisis, eutrophication, acidification of the oceans, and all of that. So anyway, uh, well done to Greta Thunberg. I'm, I thought she was never going to mention that. Um, and I was thinking, oh no, and yet another one, just, for, um, you know, finding that too. Uh, they don't, didn't want to mention it because, because of the pushback, but she did. So here we go with a 16 year old doing what other, what all the other green groups, including Extinction Rebellion and, and Sunrise Movement and all of that do not do. Isn't this, what sort of a weird world is this? And talking about weird worlds and, where up is down and black is white. Um, uh, Tucker Carlson. Now, I'm no fan of Tucker Carlson, and if you followed anything about him, he's uh, quite a, a big Islamophobe. He's a racist. He's a huge misogynist. So, um, you know, that's really unfortunate. But it, oddly enough, every so often, he speaks the truth about uh, U.S. interventionism, U.S. Uh, imperialism, and he has... Uh, and oddly enough, uh, just before, or just, I think it was just before Donald Trump, uh, was thinking about invading Iran. Um, he, uh, did a, did a, a video about it and apparently that had some influence. It's sad that we've got a situation where people do not go, go and, uh, cause a, what will probably turn out to be a World War III because of, uh, because of a few reasons, but that was apparently that was one of them. Uh, him sort of saying that that was going to be the end of his presidency if he did that. It's sad that um, somebody's worry about their 2020 campaign and their presidency um, is what stopped them from going in and, and bombing Iran, which could cause World War Three eventually because Russia and China would come in and try and uh, assist Iran. They don't want to see that sort of destabilization and uh, they know that they'll be next. But um, that's how it is. And there's this other thing, too, I, I watched. Um, I very rarely watch mainstream media because I just find it sort of makes me want to grab for a basket, you know. <laughs> it's just so awful and such propaganda. But I watched um, some of uh, Trump speaking about um, why he didn't invade Iran. Um, and he said, you know, apparently he, it was all set to go, planes in the sky, and 10 minutes before they were supposed to bomb, Apparently, this is his story. Okay, I don't know if I, I don't really know if I believe it. Um, that he talked to, uh, you know, he says he has hawks like Bolton, and he has other people. And he talked to some people, and they, and he asked how many p 
people would be killed in it, how many Iranians, and they said 150, and he said, oh, and he thought to him, this is what he said, he thought to himself, no, I'm not going to do that because it was, they sh we shot down, they shot down an unmanned drone, even though it was very expensive, unmanned drone, um, over what he said is international waters, that's a nonsense, it was over Iranian airspace. Um, and he said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to sacrifice 150 Iranians over an unmanned drone that was taken down. Okay. So this is, I'm, I'm not a journalist. So this is what, this is how I speculate about this. Um, firstly, Donald Trump is involved, US backed Saudi genocide of Yemenis right now. And that's been going on since Obama. Uh, it's probably four years now. One child every 10 minutes is, dies from famine and disease. Uh, in Yemen, and um, two mothers, I think, uh, is it, I don't know if it's two mothers every hour or more frequently than that, die in childbirth. Basically, there's a genocide in Yemen, and the U.S. has been backing it uh, for a few years now. They've been fueling, they used to fuel planes in the air, they've been helping them with all sorts of things, basically. Uh, so, you know, when when Donald Trump says things like, I care about the 150 Iranians, and then he says, goes on to say, and I, I know a lot of Iranians in New York and I love them, you know, they're, they're good people and all this sort of nonsense. I mean, this is just campaign talk. He couldn't care less about, you know, his campaign promise was not to do, not to start any new wars. And he's got, he, and yet he, he, uh, got into his administration, John Bolton, who's been wanting to bomb Iran and overthrow Iran for, I don't know, a few decades now, a couple of decades at least. He's a complete, uh, as, as Tucker Carlson said, he's completely demented, really, which is an interesting that Fox News would actually say something like that. Then he's got Pompeo, which also, who also, who believes in the rapture and is completely pro-Israel and wants to see the end of Iran as well. So, you know, he, he has in his administration, uh, two people who are completely, um, you know, they're completely, uh, hawkish and they wanted to see the end of Iran for a long time. So it, uh, it's bizarre that he should have that. And, you know, he has been funded in his campaign, his uh, 2016 campaign by Sheldon Adelson, who is uh, completely pro-Israel and wants to see the end of Iran. And so I feel, I feel like there is on the horizon at some point, whether it's now, whether it's soon or later or after he is elected, after Donald Trump is elected, that, uh, Sheldon Adelson would get, will get his payback for all the tens of millions of dollars he gave Donald Trump for his election, and they will bomb Iran, they will invade Iran and overthrow that government. And once again, there'll be another destroyed country in the Middle East by the United States, by the US empire. It's a rogue empire, and that's what it intends to do. And so this nonsense that Donald Trump doesn't want to invade Iran because um, he doesn't want to kill Iranians when he's actually killing you know, with the US backed Saudi genocide in Yemen, one child every 10 minutes and has done since his presidency. And it's been happening before that. I think that's the irony of that, the hypocrisy of that. So I don't believe that at all. Uh, I think one would have to be a real fool to believe that he, he, his, he was concerned about killing Iranians, please. So, um, I feel, you know, and there's been other commentators who've said this, that, you know, basically, he is concerned about his 2020 campaign, his campaign, one of his campaign promises, and of course he's got a massive ego. Um, I think he loves the fact that he can say, well, I just, you know, decided not to bomb these people, you know, I didn't kill people because, well, I just thought, no, um, it's, I'm not going to do it. You know, he loves that sort of power of, of being able to say, no, don't, don't, you know, don't invade a country. Magnanimous sort of, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, Roman emperor sort of thing, you know, the thumbs, thumbs up kind of or thumbs down sort of thing. I really think it's as simple as that with him, uh, that he's just such, has such a huge ego and he loves the thought of being able to say, Oh, I decided not to invade a country and because I didn't want to kill those people, but I had the power to just do it right there and then kill all those, uh, Iranians just like that or whatever, bomb this, bomb that. You know, I mean, it, it's so sick that we're in the hands of these psychopaths and children. Man children, that gives children a bad name. He's a man child. He's, and I mean, I, I sometimes look back at, you know, when he was on The Apprentice and I think, wow, they must have really staged that well to make him look like he actually had some sort of intelligence. Because honestly, the man can hardly string a sentence together, yet he can actually, uh, he can be manipulated too, but he also is a warmonger. 
I mean, they must have managed him so carefully in that show, which was really just a, it was his campaign started back when he was on, you know, running The Apprentice, when he was on The Apprentice. So anyway, this is that where we're at now. We have children, you know, and giving children a bad name. We have children sort of uh, with gigantic egos uh, who are uh, deciding whether to start World War Three or not uh, over over their campaign promises, pretending like they care about Iranians and pretending like they don't want to start a new war, um, you know, because they've made a campaign promise and they want to be re-elected. After he's re-elected, he won't give a toss, I, th I don't think, about what people think or don't think. You, you know, he's all he's manipulating his base. Um, he's manipulating, you know, if, if he thinks he's manipulating everybody, he's got another thing coming. Um, so, you know, and also the thing too about this is this is something that isn't said because, you know, the U.S. empire, all the military industrial complex, they, this American exceptionalism that they're the most powerful and that they sort of own the world, they, the Venezuela is in their backyard, that Monroe doctrine. Once a colonialist, all, always a colonialist, they, they just think that they can go around dictating to countries, you know, what, what you can do and what you can't do and who, who you can deal with and who you can't deal with. And if you don't do what we want, we'll put economic sanctions, which is an act of war, like they've killed 40,000 Venezuelans in Venezuela since 2017 with their awful U.S. economic sanctions. And they're putting more and more sanctions on Iran, which is affecting them terribly. But meanwhile, uh, what's happening is that they are, the U.S. with this, and particularly uh, headed by Trump, who's, who's such a, an egomaniac, um, and, and really is so clueless about a lot of things and does things on impulse. Um, what is happening is Russia and China and the rest of Asia, uh, the Belt and Road and all of that, that all of those people are allying together. They're all banding together because they see such a, this is such a rogue empire threatening them all, all the time and really looking for opportunities to invade and bomb. I mean, so they're all banding together. So what the U.S. empire and its, the rogue empire is doing is basically creating a massive sort of a, um, allied force against it. And also economically, which is probably even more, more something that is going to bring down the U.S. empire is that economically all these countries are doing deals with one another and eventually are going to exclude in many ways the U.S. So the U.S. is actually isolating itself, the U.S. empire with its, uh, warmongering rhetoric, with its threats of economic sanctions on everybody that doesn't do what the U.S. wants them to do and all this kind of thing. So they're actually shooting themselves in the face with all of this um, carryings on. And sadly, I can see with the, the Democratic Party who would rather have a Republican win than have a anybody who's remotely progressive win, I can see that he's going to, Donald Trump's going to win again in 2020. I do not see that uh, the Democrats with, this, with their ridiculous Joe Biden, who's really, uh, most of these uh, Democrats would have been Republicans years ago. They're so near conservative, a lot of them. And they're warmongers. And they're anti, you know, Joe Biden is anti-choice and all of this sort of thing. I mean, they're, they're no alternative. So, you know, you've got these two, like, Republican parties, really, basically, is what you have. One is pretending to be the, public, the party of diversity and the part, part, you know, just exploiting identity politics, basically, so they can pretend to be the public, the party of diversity. But they're just neoliberal, neoconservative, uh, awful, it's just an awful party that needs to, to end. And that's what they, that's the alternative to Donald Trump. So, and with all the nonsense of the Russiagate for the last two years, he's probably going to romp in because they've been lying about that whole collusion thing. He's a lot of things. He's, he's a really awful character and he's a really awful president, right? They're all awful, really, but he's, he's all over the place too, like a dog's breakfast, basically, if I can use that term. Um, but he's, that the Russians using him as some sort of Manchurian candidate, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you were going to choose, even if that was possible, would you choose Trump? I mean, the man is not the brightest bulb in the box, let's face it, really. So anyway, um, so all that Russiagate thing, that's probably going to bring him home in 2020. I mean, the, you know, it's frightening, really, because he'll see that as a mandate, basically. He'll see that as a mandate to do whatever he wants when he gets in in 2020. If he doesn't get in, I'd be really surprised. Uh, so... Anyway, that, that's sort of, so this uh, thing with Tucker Carlson, I, I've gotten off the track, but Tucker Carlson was, uh, basically saying in his, uh, you know, thing before Donald Trump had actually 
d was going to do that attack on Iran, he said, well, you know, you'll destroy your own presidency, basically. Um, which is true, but I mean, it should be, you know, what a way of looking at it. How about destroying a country and killing, probably ending up killing thousands and thousands of Iranians, plus thousands of uh, US soldiers, and then possibly starting World War Three? Wouldn't that be something to be more concerned about? But anyway, Tucker Carlson, then he did another one calling um, John Bolton demented. I might show you some of that. Um, I'm not sure about the copyright sort of things that, with Fox News. It's funny, sometimes there's, if you just make it a little small, image, uh, it can be fine. I'll have to find out about that. So I might just play the audio with a couple of images, play the audio with an image of both of um, Tucker Carlson and you can listen to that. It's sort of quite interesting because on the other side of it with all the MSNBC and CNN and all those so-called liberal media, uh, they have been, of course, uh, wanting, wanting war. They just applaud any sort of attempts that are made, any sort of talk of war, they just love it you know, trying to manufacture consent. And and by the way, I may may or may not show that Greta Thunberg. I might leave a link to it because this video is getting a little long. But um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the information section. You can find it on Facebook. I haven't seen it on YouTube. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing was Sean Hannity from Fox News, who um, was absolutely um, unhinged when he, uh, when he was talking about Donald Trump and how they should... I mean, honestly, the language... It was appalling. Um, I'll see if I can, I'll leave a link to that if I don't show you, show you it in this video. But he was absolutely unhinged and, and <clears throat> basically kept on saying things like, I want to see these, uh, next generation weapons, no boots on the ground. I want to see next generation weapons bombing Iran or, and sort of because they bombed one of our unmanned drones. I mean, really and truly, he was just absolutely, you know, it's just disgusting the way these people talk you know, so-called journalists, please. Um, and it looked like he was giving a little bit of a nod to um, the weapons industry, you know, let's get, let's plow some more hundreds of billions of dollars into next generation development so we can, you know, no, I mean, does he really think that no soldiers are going to be involved in this Iranian thing? Seriously and truly, that is a lie if he thinks that's going to be the case. Um, and he, he was just warmongering for all his worth. And this is the sort of these are the these are the so-called fourth estate that are manufacturing consent for you know these awful wars. Honestly, it's an insanity. And here we are on the brink of extinction with the climate crisis pretty much in runaway global warming now. And here they are trying to start wars, more wars. I mean, this is the insanity. This is the sort of insane planet we have now where everybody, it should be just this climate emergency that every single person on the planet should be trying to address, even if it is too late, though, addressing everybody should be thinking, going vegan. Everybody should be doing whatever they can. Every politician should be focused solely really on that because it's it's a matter of life and death for not just us, for, for other animals. The planet will go on without us, but, I mean, you know, this is we're coming to the end, basically. And we're helping it along because nobody is doing anything. Politicians aren't doing anything. Corporations will not do anything um, because capitalism is ecocide. And uh, here we are marching, galloping towards extinction. And here are these psychopaths in office in the United States trying to start new wars for oil because uh, Venezuela has the largest oil reserves. Um, they, Donald Trump says, oh, we're not interested in their oil. Yes, they are. They're the fourth largest reserves and they, they want to control part of the, the the Persian Gulf and they want to invade that country. They want to do it because Israel um, because Israel wants it wants them gone and the Israel lobby is a powerful lobby in the United States and elsewhere in the world. There's a whole bunch of reasons. But the thing is that if you've watched, you know, the thing is, and this is something that hasn't been brought up, I'm just going to leave you with this. And if you watch um, the, the video I posted of George Galloway talking about it, he does it very eloquently, as George Galloway does, that um, it will be, un as he said, it will unleash uh, the gate, you know, it'll be like a hell, and it won't be good for anybody, because uh, Iran, Iran has a lot of allies, a lot of allies, and it's not like a broken Iraq or anything. They have a lot of allies, and they 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 may not have the same sort of firepower as the U.S., but they have... Uh, sort of quite a competent army, and they have lots and lots of allies. It's, it would be, it's going to be a bloodbath, and there'll be people, there'll be um, countries coming from, all, you know, all over the place to assist them. It'll turn into a world war. 
and that Russia has said they do not want to see Iran invaded. And so is, and China goes along with that because they, they know that the U.S. is coming for them. The U.S. is basically coming for any country that is an economic threat, that is a, a power just like they are. And, the, and, the, and Russia has um, superior nuclear weapons to the United States. And one more thing, the Pentagon is, has put out some papers saying they think that they can win a nuclear attack on someone. That's how crazy it is. Dr. Strange love crazy. You know, this is the sort of nutty, 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 in psych psychopathic sort of uh, rulers that we have who are just doing their own thing and all of us are irrelevant. Anyway, um, on that happy note, um, if you if you like the content on this channel, please click the subscribe button and the notifications bell. Um, or otherwise, you don't receive um, updates. Um, please click the like button if you like the content. And uh, oh, I always enjoy your comments. Thank you so much for leaving them and taking the time to leave them. My name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Thanks Signals from Vegas. Stay tuned. I'll um, probably share at least one of those interviews, either if it's Greta Thunberg or somebody else. And if I don't, I'll, I'll leave them in the information section of this video, a link to them. Thanks so much for watching. Till next time. Bye for now. Just 24 hours ago, this country stood on the brink of cataclysm. After weeks of slow escalation and without a single vote from the Congress, the United States came within minutes of war with Iran. In response to the destruction of an unmanned drone, American forces nearly launched an airstrike on Iranian targets. According to some reports, our planes were literally in the air. But in the end, it didn't happen. The president pulled back. This morning, he explained why. They came and they said, sir, we're ready to go. We'd like a decision. I said, I want to know something before you go. How many people will be killed? In this case, Iranians. Mm -hmm. I said, how many people are going to be killed? Uh, sir, I'd like to get back to you on that. Great people, these generals. They said, uh, came back, said, sir, approximately 150. And I thought about it for a second. And I said, you know what? They shut down an unmanned uh, drone, mm -hmm. plane, whatever you want to call it. And here we are sitting with 150 dead people uh, that would have taken place probably within a half an hour after I said, go ahead. Yeah. And I didn't like it. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was proportionate. How many people will be killed? The most basic of all questions, but a question that's too rarely asked by leaders contemplating war. 150 people wiped off the planet in retaliation for a broken drone. Every one of them, the president reminded his staff last night, someone with a family. The whole thing, in the end, offended his sense of decency. He said it seemed disproportionate, and it was. Moreover, airstrikes would have led to a wider conflict with Iran. That, of course, was the entire point of it. Policymakers in Washington crave a war with Iran. Last night was supposed to be the first domino. At the last minute, the president thwarted their plans. For that, he's being vilified. Watch CNN's 36-year-old national security analyst attack the president for not killing enough people yesterday. This is kind of a worst case scenario. The president is showing that he ostensibly made a decision, had a National Security Council meeting, and wasn't willing to follow through. All in all, this shows gross disorganization and a president who can't seem to make up his mind, even on something as important as a military strike on Iran. Only in foreign policy circles do people say things that stupid. In fact, last night was a high point in the Trump presidency. Bombing Iran would have ended his political career in a minute. There'd be no chance of reelection after that. Ill-advised wars are like doing cocaine. The initial rush rises your poll numbers, but the crash is inevitable. And in this case, it would be horrible. The hangover from an Iraq war would last years. Iran is not Syria or Iraq. It's a big, rich, sophisticated country with an ancient culture and a cohesive population. In some ways, it's an impressive place, not at all like the chintzy prefab capitals of the Arab world, like Riyadh or Dubai. We could beat Iran, but it would not be easy. It would cost trillions of dollars. Many thousands of Americans likely would die. China would love it. They'd be the only winners in that conflict. Donald Trump was elected president precisely to keep us out of disasters like war with Iran. So how did we get so close to starting one? Simple. The neocons still wield enormous power in Washington. They don't care what the cost of a war with Iran is. They certainly don't care what the effect on Trump's political fortunes might be. They despise Donald Trump. Now, one of their key allies is the National Security Advisor of the United States. John Bolton is an old friend of Bill Kristol's. Together, they helped plan the Iraq War. When Bolton made it to the White House, the neocons cheered. Left-wing New York Times columnist Brett Stevens took a break from attacking Donald Trump to celebrate his hiring. 
Stevens assured MSNBC viewers that John Bolton was a great choice because he would push the president toward war. He is not uh, the sort of caricaturish uh, hawk that he's been made out to be in some in some corners of the press. I think someone like Bolton is going to restrain the isolationist impulses that have been uh, really at the heart of uh, Trump's foreign policy thinking. Got that? John Bolton is going to restrain Donald Trump from avoiding war. And of course, that's exactly what he's tried to do from the very first day. Shortly before Bolton took his new job, we invited him on this show and asked about some of his many many previous foreign policy positions. Watch as Bolton denies ever being wrong, ever, about anything, not even a little bit. So you've, you've called for regime change in Iraq, Libya, Iran, and Syria. In the first two countries, we've had regime change, and obviously it's been, I'd say disaster, I think no, we agree. No, I, I don't agree with that, and, and let, me, let me... You don't think it's been a disaster? No, I think you need to understand yeah. is that life is complicated in the Middle East, and when you say, well, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein was a mistake, well, is simplest. I, I would argue that I'm the one who understands how complicated it is, but just my view. It's, it's your long experience in foreign policy, I know. <laughs> Better record than yours, I would say. Got that? Hillary Clinton's toppling of the Libyan government was not a disaster, says John Bolton. Keep in mind, there are literally slave markets operating in the streets of Tripoli right now. No problem, though. Bolton's fine with that. He's fine with the outcome in Iraq, too. That wasn't a disaster either. According to John Bolton, it was a raging success. We killed hundreds of thousands of people, lost thousands of our own troops, spent more than a trillion dollars, all to eliminate a WMD threat that, despite John Bolton's assurances, never existed in the first place. Bolton is glad we did all that, really happy about it. That's demented. Normal people don't talk like that. There's nothing normal about John Bolton. Check out this piece of tape, recently uncovered, in which Bolton promises that we're going to overthrow the government of Iran. Keep in mind that this was filmed long before the Iranians shot down a single drone. I have said for over 10 years since coming to these events that the declared policy of the United States of America should be the overthrow of the Mullah's regime in Tehran. And that's why before 2019, we here will celebrate in Tehran. Thank you very much. In other words, last night has been in the works for years. John Bolton is a kind of bureaucratic tapeworm. Try as you might, you can't expel him. He seems to live forever in the bowels of the federal agencies, periodically re-emerging to cause pain and suffering, but critically, somehow, never suffering himself. His life really is Washington in a nutshell. Blunder into obvious catastrophes again and again, refuse to admit blame, and then demand more of the same. That's the John Bolton life cycle. In between administration jobs are always cushy think tank posts, paid speaking gigs, cable news contracts, War may be a disaster for America, but for John Bolton and his fellow neocons, it is always good business. My name is Greta Thunberg, and I am a climate activist. Around the year 2030, we will be in a position where we probably set off an irreversible chain reaction beyond human control that will most likely lead to the end of our civilization as we know it. That is, unless in that time, permanent and unprecedented changes in all aspects of industrialized society have taken place, including a reduction of our CO2 emissions by at least 50%. And please note that these calculations are depending on inventions that have not yet been invented at scale. Furthermore, these scientific calculations do not include most unforeseen tipping points and feedback loops. Nor do these calculations include already locked in warming hidden by toxic air pollution, nor the aspect of equity which is absolutely necessary to make the Paris Agreement work on a global scale. And these calculations are not opinions or wild guesses. These projections from the IPCC are backed up by scientific facts. So, if we are to stay below the 1.5 degrees of warming limit, which is still possible within the laws of physics, 
we need to change almost everything. We need to start living within the planetary boundaries. This will be a drastic change for many, but not for most. Because most of the world's population is already living within the planetary boundaries. It is a minority who are not. The richest 10% of the world's population emits about half of our emissions of greenhouse gases. The richest 1% emits more than the poorest 50%. And this is not about glorifying poverty. This is about the laws of physics and the remaining amount of greenhouse gases that we can still emit into the atmosphere to be in line with the Paris Agreement. It is not people in countries like Mozambique, Bangladesh or Colombia who are the most responsible for this crisis. It is mostly down to people like you here in the audience, entrepreneurs, celebrities, politicians, business leaders, people who have a lot of power, people who consume enormous amounts of stuff, who often fly around the world sometimes in private jets. Your individual carbon footprints are in some cases the equivalent of whole villages. But I think the worst part is that you are normalizing this extreme lifestyle because people look up to you. You are the role models. You are setting the standards. People aspire to be like you. About 100 companies emit approximately 71% of our total emissions of CO2. And yes, I know we need a system change rather than individual change, but you cannot have one without the other. If you look through history, all the big changes in society have been started by people at the grassroots level. No system change can come without pressure from large groups of individuals. And no, I don't blame you. I know you are not acting like this because you are stupid. You are not ruining the biosphere and future living conditions for all species because you are evil. At least, I hope not. I know that almost every one of you are simply uninformed just like the rest of the world's population. I know that you here in the audience didn't travel here to see a 16-year-old girl who says strange and uncomfortable things. But you know what? We need to dare to be uncomfortable. We need to be brave enough to say and do things that may not increase our profits or our popularity because otherwise we won't stand a chance. We need to start thinking outside the box to acknowledge that we don't have all the solutions to the climate and ecological crisis yet, unless those solutions mean that we simply stop doing certain things. We need to accept that the market and new technologies will not solve everything for us. We need to admit our common failure and then we need to act while there is still time. At meetings like these, you love to listen to entrepreneurs, new ideas, new inventions. But when it comes to the climate crisis, the time for those magic new inventions has just about come and gone. And even though we, we most certainly need to embrace every bit of new, clean technology, we can no longer look away from the obvious fact that we also need to change our behavior, and some more than others. The theme of this year's Brilliant Mind conference is Flexibility Quotient. It's what the organizers call a symphony of big picture thinking. Well, here is some big picture thinking for you. 
If you regularly fly around the world, eat meat and dairy, and are living a high carbon lifestyle, that means you have used up countless of people's remaining carbon budgets. Carbon budgets that they will need in their everyday life for generations to come. And if that wasn't enough, those whose carbon budgets we are sealing are the ones least responsible and the ones who are going to be affected the most by this crisis. Everyone and everything needs to change, but the bigger your platform, the bigger your responsibility. The bigger your carbon footprint, the bigger your moral duty. To make the changes required, we need role models and leaders, people like you. I am certain that most of you sitting here will have the courage, the wisdom and the common sense to take a few steps back to see the full picture, to make the sacrifices that are necessary and to become the leaders we need you to be. The question is, will you do it in time? Future generations are counting on you. Don't let us down. Thank you.